everybody. Welcome into the Penn State 365 podcast. My name is Dylan Count Crowley of Ninny Nation of the Rivals Network covering Penn State football and athletics. I am the beat writer and recruiting analyst over there. Um, I'm joined by my co-host, of course, Marty Leap of BlackStreetDiaries.com and our resident super fan, Anthony, is on. Uh, I'm just going to let these, you know, two uh, super fans here, I guess we'll call them, uh, really just kind of rant about this game. We, we like to think the the thing that makes our podcast different is we bring the journalistic view from me uh, and somewhat Marty, uh, since he does write with Black Shoe Diaries, but also a fan aspect of it. We, we can give the professional journalistic view on any podcast. There's a hundred Penn State podcasts out there. You can get that view from anybody, but to get both the, you know, journalistic, I'm going to try to be the voice of reason here. And the fan view is unique. And I think it's going to be a really interesting episode. We're not going to try to go on forever because let's be honest, uh, Marty and Anthony don't want to talk about this episode for more than they have to. And if you're a Penn State fan, you probably just want to forget that this game on Saturday against Michigan ever happened. It, it was ugly. It was, um, well, I'll, I'll let them talk about it. Um, but of course, before we get started, our podcast uh, sponsored by Adam Goldman of FranchiseCoach.net. Uh, Adam uh, is just a tremendous resource for you if you want to get into the franchise business. Um, he has a very thorough and free a consultation process, 100% free. Um, he he makes your own uh, new business made easy. Uh, you can find him at franchisecoach.net or at 844-800-3726. Again, 844-800-3726 or at franchisecoach.net. Uh, but gentlemen, let's get right to it. Penn State got um, their butts whooped for four quarters on Saturday, 41-17 by Michigan. They did have a lead in the third quarter at one point, uh, but they really never had a chance to really win this game. Um, Anthony, let's start with you. What's just your, what is your passionate rant take here? I'll, I'll give you a couple minutes. Yeah, I won't take more than a minute or two, but it was embarrassing. It was pathetic. It was a complete exposure of this program from the top down. Sure. Um, they just, they looked horrible. I mean, defensively, they didn't show up. Offensively, they didn't show up. I don't want to say they were disinterested, but it looked like they were disinterested in even being there. You know, you had two weeks to prepare for this game. It's a top 10 matchup. Biggest game of the entire season to this point. And there was no heart. <laughs> I mean, it just felt like they didn't even want to be there. You know, I mean, coaching was a complete failure this week, and that starts obviously with James Franklin, but there was no offensive identity. You know, they didn't try to confuse Michigan's defense at all. You know, they didn't try to throw anything out there that would, you know, scheme to get their best players out in space. Defensively, they didn't do anything to try to take Blake Corham or Donovan Edwards out of the equation and make J.J. McCarthy beat you. It was almost as if they psyched themselves out and, and thought Michigan was going to try to do something different when everybody knew they were going to sure. run down their throats. So yeah. you've completely embarrassed yourself and you got your butts kicked. It was well-deserved. The final score doesn't even do what Michigan did to Penn State enough justice. You know, that game yes, it really been, doesn't. That game should have been even worse than the final score indicated. Michigan didn't yeah. even put the ball one time. Their punter had a day off. That is disgusting to think about. Like, my blood boils when I think about the fact that Michigan didn't punt the ball once. We were completely outmatched, outmatched, outclassed, outsized, out whatever. And I know Franklin talked about that. We can get into that later if you guys want. But just every aspect of the game, Michigan controlled it from the very first snap. And Penn State looked like they didn't even belong on the field with them. I don't know where they go from here. but. They better find something because as a fan, I'm embarrassed. Um, they should be embarrassed and completely ashamed of themselves. And that starts with James Franklin. Yeah, well, well said, Anthony. And before we go to Marty, just a couple uh, key uh, stats from this one. Uh, pulled up the wrong game. Give me one second. Uh, yeah, some key stats on this one. Just like Anthony said, the, 
the final score doesn't do it justice. 563 total yards for Michigan, including 418 yards on the ground, 7.6 yards per uh, rush for Michigan. Um, Penn State's offense, of course, wasn't able to do anything really all day. Um, they averaged technically five yards per carry, uh, but that was really heavily inflated by Sean Clifford's 62-yard run. Uh, beyond that, their longest run of the day was nine yards from Nick Singleton. Singleton and Allen averaged 3.2 and 2.7 yards, uh, respectively. But uh, while the offense did nothing on Saturday, the story of the game was, of course, the defense. Like I said, the 418 rushing yards, 173 out of Donovan Edwards, uh, 166 out of Blake Corum. Um, just a lot to clean up, say the least. Marty, uh, we talked throughout the game on Saturday. Uh, you were pretty passionate about it. Um, oh, just what's what's your what's your rant here? <clears throat> yeah, it, embarrassing. I, I, there's really no other way to go about it. It's, it's embarrassing. You know, you come out off a of bye week. You know, one of the games of the week in college football, one of the premier matchups early part of the season, top ten matchup, both teams five and zero. Oh. Uh, that the team that you consistently battle for that that mantle of second best program in the Big Ten, um, and you were just dominated. Um, yeah, like, like Anthony said, forty-one to seventeen doesn't even do this thing justice. Uh, the game was not even nearly that close. Um, the offense just never could get going at all. The offensive line played horrible. Uh, Sean Clifford did not play well at all. Um, I mean, I thought the receivers. Probably had their best game of the season, but they didn't really. Do a whole yeah, lot they were good there. Yeah, um, the defense defense line was blown off the ball. Uh, the linebackers continue to be a problem. Uh, Michigan's offensive line too many times was able to get to that second level, and their blocking schemes pretty much with ease. So yeah, I, I don't I don't know what the coaches were thinking. I, I don't understand what the hell the game plan was on this front because nothing worked on either side. And on defense, just they didn't really give themselves an opportunity to be successful with, you know, you're facing a run-heavy team and they're they're not stacking the box. They're not trying to force them to throw the ball. You're playing your safeties 15, 16 yards deep. I, I don't get it. I don't know. But there, there's definitely a lot of soul searching and a lot of looking in the mirror that needs to be done in the Lash building this week. And it, it all starts at the top of James Franklin. Now, I will say with the offense, um, it's hard. It really is hard to tell what the game plan was, but at the same time, yes, the first two drives were not great. You know, just six plays for a total of uh, 14 yards. Um, but um, I, I think what didn't help the offense was that the defense was out there, you know, for the uh, the first three drives for Michigan, all uh, which – took up most of the first half, 11 plays, 13 plays, 13 plays for five minutes, six minutes, six minutes. I mean, right there, 17 minutes of clock time, clock possession for Michigan, which definitely didn't help Penn State's offense really try to help find an identity in this game. Because by the time they got the ball back for their uh, third possession there, they were already down uh, only six, not then at the time. But... um. Sorry, they were down thirteen nothing at the time for their third possession. Uh, and but that possession was good for them. They went seven plays, seventy five yards, and then their next real possession, they went nine plays, seventy yards, and that was in the second half. So I, it did seem like there for a minute that the offense was going to have something going and perhaps could keep them in the game. There was hope for them, but after that, I mean, three out of the next four drives. Uh, were turnover on downs, nine, nine plays for 36, five for 16, six for 22, nine for 42. They weren't able to find any sustainable success to keep the defense off the field. And then when the defense was on the field, they couldn't get off the field for their life. I mean, we, I guess let's start with the defense because uh, the offense could have went out there, put up 35 points and it would have mattered. Um, at the end of the day, this defensive performance by Penn State on Saturday is one of the worst we've seen of the James Franklin era by far, and one of the best, worst we've seen. I mean, Marty, you're a little bit – I mean, was this the worst defensive performance? And 
I mean, I guess you could look at 2016 Michigan, but uh, it's been a while since there was a game like this where they were just thoroughly dominated and there was no chance of stopping them. Yeah, you know, yeah, you go back yeah, to 2016 back Michigan, and, and to me that's a little bit different because going into that game, I think everyone expected that to be a blowout. Um, and if I recall, they were quite beat up in that game too. Before, yeah, yeah, they game. literally yeah, yeah. like didn't have linebackers available. Um, the hey, last that's time, a common that, that, that's a commonality between this game. <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, um, the the last time I can think of a Penn State team that was ranked this highly with these kinds of expectations going into a game that just looked totally incompetent on defense. Man, I'd probably have to go back to that Rose Bowl against USC. Um, when they turned Mark Sanchez into a first-round pick. And even that was so much different because that was USC out-athleting Penn State um, and terrorizing an old and outdated defense of Tom Bradley's that didn't work anymore. It wasn't I, – I can't – I honestly cannot think of a game quite like this where Penn State was just manhandled and mauled and dominated in the trenches the way they were on Saturday – um, the, the defense obviously played poorly, but early on they battled, they forced some field goals. They gave the offense a chance to get going when Curtis Jacobs got to pay, even early in the third quarter, when it was 17, 16, the defense had a chance to right the ship and there was just no adjustments made whatsoever by Manny Diaz. I have no idea what he was thinking. Um, and Michigan just continued to run up and down the field on them. But yeah, it was it was one of the worst, if not the worst, defensive performance I've ever seen from a Penn State team. I mean, like, given that year with Bill O'Brien, they gave up, I think, like 70 points when it was to Ohio State. That team had, like, 50 scholarship guys on it going against Urban Meyer and an unbeaten Ohio State team. But something like this, I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen anything like it. and It was just horrible. Yeah, I mean, and I think the most – I, not amazing, but there was no adjustments made in this game. And it, at least by what we could see, there was no adjustments made. I mean, uh, at no point did Penn State try to stack the box. Uh, at no point were the safeties, you know, walking down. Uh, I, I mean, at, at, did you guys notice any, you know, major adjustments in this game for, from – the time it started to the time it finished. I mean, it seemed like it was the same game plan from the first series to the last series, and uh, and nobody cared to make a difference. And, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's a thing. Like, if Manny Diaz isn't making that adjustment, James Franklin has to go to him and demand a change. I, I mean, I, I don't get how everybody just sat back and let that type of thing happen. Um, it just it, – it's baffling to me. From from my complete unbiased view, it's completely baffling. Yeah, it's it's baffling to me because you played a team already in Auburn that had a similar rushing attack, and you were able to shut them down, and and they would they became a non factor in that game. Why was the game plan any different in this one? Why were they so worried about JJ McCarthy? Like McCarthy played a solid game, but he didn't play spectacularly. It wasn't you. Like you have the best secondary in the Big Ten. Force the young quarterback to throw into your secondary. Bingo! You have the best secondary in the Big Ten, in my opinion. Lean on those guys. You know, bring your safeties in, stack the box, bring eight guys into the box, and leave your DBs on an island. Like, yeah, you can leave one safety back from time to time, maybe two in obvious passing downs. But when your game plan for Michigan is running the ball and they were doing it at will and they were moving your defensive line at will, bring more guys into the box and force them to pass. I don't think McCarthy had the ability to really take the top off of your secondary with consistency. He might have done it a couple of times, but he wasn't going to destroy you with it. And if he does then you can live with that as the end result because you force them to adjust and go off of their primary game plan and, and make something else happen. You can live with that if you're a player, a coach, or a fan. What you can't live with is the fact that you knew what they were going to do the entire time. The fans, everybody knew what Michigan's game plan was going to be, and they did it to perfection, and you did nothing to try to fix it. 
That is absolutely disgusting. And that's on Manny Diaz. That's on James Franklin. I, 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 I just cannot wrap my head around the fact that there was nothing done to at least try and stack the box and stop the run and prevent them from at least going off for 70 and 60 yards on back-to-back plays. Just mind-baffling. Yeah, and it was, before we go to Marty, I mean, you said it perfectly there, Anthony. And we can talk about – we can talk about the offense a ton, but at the same time, like I said, if the offense puts up 30 points, it doesn't matter because the defense wasn't making any stops in this game. Um, I, I look back at the defense. I Obviously, the defensive line did not perform up to key. I think, I mean, I, they had some nice schemes and some nice ways to go around that they game plan, but there just wasn't plays made. A lot of missed tackles. I think Penn State missed at least 12 tackles in that game is the number. Um, the defensive line actually did pretty good against uh, – sorry. I was thinking about the offensive line. We'll get to that. Um, but uh, the defense line did not have – did not do anything good. Uh, while the defensive line didn't do anything good, me and Marty talked about this uh, coming in the game, but the linebackers were going to have to be a major reason of success on the defense side of the ball for Penn State to win the game. You had to put your athletic linebackers out there. Abdul Carter, Curtis Jacobs. Curtis Jacobs did end up playing quite a bit. Abdul Carter played a, a good handful. Obviously still has a lot to learn, and he didn't have a perfect game or anything close to it. But at the same time, they had played Tyler Elston and I think Jonathan Southern out there way too much when you're facing two of the most athletic running backs in the Big Ten. Um, it was evident from very early on that Elston was not going to have success going up against Quorum or Edwards. I mean, uh, the one play that all sticks out to us is when Quorum, just after kind of a small little hurdle, uh, bounced off Tyler Elston, who tried to shove him out of bounds. Uh, Anthony, uh, I think your quote was, when will Elson stop trying to be a bumper car out there, right? Yeah, he yeah, thought he was a bumper car. Thought he was a bumper car. Yeah, <laughs> and and it, yeah. Blake Quorum easily bounced off of him and picked up more yardage. Um, Marty, what, what are your thoughts about playing guys like Elson and Sutherland out there that much? I mean, we talked about it. it that was not going to be a key to success. The key to success was going to have your athletic linebackers, which Curtis Jacobs was out there a lot. He didn't have a good game. But Curtis Jacobs was out there a lot. But I, I just – I don't understand putting guys like Elsden and Southern out there who are probably your two least athletic linebackers when you're going up against that talented of a backfield because you have to put your defense and your players in a position to make plays and to be successful. And putting them out there is not going – is not your best chance to be successful. And you can't really even be mad at Elsden or Southern. It, it's, it's not like they're out there – trying not to be the most athletic guys. They're just – they're that's not who they are. But, Marty, what's your thoughts? I T- Tyler Ellison, he, he doesn't belong on a Big Ten roster. Um, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be harsh, but the kid just – he ain't it. He doesn't have it. He's so slow, and he cannot tackle and just he, – he's one of the worst linebackers I've ever watched play football at Penn State. Um Jonathan Sutherland, again, <clears throat> by all accounts, a great young man. And, you know, he's been a four-year captain, great leader for this team, but it's just he's not hes not a Big Ten linebacker. And it's its so maddening to watch this. I, I understand he's a true freshman, and it's a lot to throw at the kid, but I just I, – I will never understand why you didn't spend that three-week stretch of Central Michigan Northwestern bye week of trying to get Abdul Carter to be able to transition to the Mike linebacker spot. Um, he's an athletic freak. He he's physical. He's violent. He's everything you want in a linebacker. And we have Tyler Elsden and Jonathan Sutherland and Dom DeLuca, who's a walk on out there running in quicksand, unable to just do much of anything. Um, so yeah, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it at all. And, you know, we, we talked Dylan on the preview show, how linebacker, while it hadn't necessarily been good this year, it had been serviceable. Um, Saturday, the linebackers were nothing short of terrible. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it has to be concerning for fans and Penn State's coaching staff alike because uh, it's not getting easier the next two weeks. You're going up against Minnesota, who may have lost um, 
Tanner Morgan to injury this past week, but they still have Mo Ibrahim, who is uh, probably one of the most underrated players in the entire Big Ten because he plays for Minnesota. Um, but Mo Ibrahim has a chance to run all day over this Penn State defense, just like uh, Corum and Edwards did. And then, I mean, you have Travion Henderson, uh, it, Mylon Williams, and probably two or three other guys that I'm forgetting right now at Ohio State who can do the same thing. It's it's not – this is not a, the stretch of games where Penn State wanted their linebackers to be exposed that badly against Michigan because the next two – Ohio State was already going to be hard enough to beat because they're a wide receiver room. Now Ohio State pro- probably thinking of themselves they could just go run the ball 50 times and win that game just as well as they probably would by throwing the ball 40 times with uh, – C.J. Stroud, it's just it, – it's a really bad week for Penn State to get exposed because the schedule's not getting easier in the next two weeks. Um, it does lighten up there a little bit. I mean, Indiana, they should still beat Maryland. Uh, possibly lost to Leah Tagovailoa for the season. Rutgers, you definitely should beat. And Michigan State, we'll see what the Spartans are come the end of the year. It's still a, a schedule Penn State should go 10-2 and two on, but – after this past weekend, it's hard to tell what this Penn State team really is at this point in the season. They've lost their entire offensive identity since that Auburn game. Defensively, uh, we probably should have noted them getting beat in the big plays as much as they did. Now that's part of the Manny Diaz, you know, defensive defense in general. But it's next week's game against Minnesota is going to determine a lot about the rest of the season. Um, let's go back to Michigan game quickly. Were you guys shocked about how poor the defensive line played, especially up the middle there, defensive tackle? Anthony? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I didn't you know, I didn't think this defensive line was elite, but I, I didn't think they were going to be exposed as, as badly as they were. You know, they were just pushed off the ball completely. Michigan's offensive line – was moving them wherever they wanted them to go. And the holes that were opened up for Corum and Edwards were truck-sized. I mean, it looked like JV versus varsity with some of these holes that were being opened up for these running backs. I mean, our offensive line could never dream of opening holes that big for for our guys. I mean, yeah, I I was a little surprised. Um, Yeah, I, I don't know what else to say. I was surprised. Yeah, the JV versus varsity comment is 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 striking, but it's 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 spot on. You know, it reminded me of a high school football game where you have a team who's like eight and zero playing that zero and eight team, and just and everything they do, do works, and it looks like you know two teams not even playing the same sport. That's what it looked like on Saturday. Um, I was surprised. Yeah, I thought this defensive line was very good. Thought it was one of the best in the Big Ten. It still might be, but it certainly didn't play that way Saturday. And just yeah, they they got pushed around and put on skates from the start, and that's not going to work against anybody, but especially against a team like Michigan with backs like Corum and Edwards. Just yeah, it, it was it was it was an embarrassing effort from John Scott Jr.'s group on Saturday. Now, now James Franklin said in the trenches they had to recruit better, they had to get big better. They have to get sorry. They have to get bigger there. It's they have to do a bunch of things in the trenches to get better at that because this it's kind of become a consistent issue for them on both sides of getting beat in these type of games against top Big Ten opponents. Um, I mean, it, at this point, it's year nine. These this is the same issues we were talking about when James Franklin first came to Penn State nine years ago, and not to mention. Just four years ago, after their loss to Ohio State, we talked about having to go from great to elite. Um, and this is kind of just saying the same thing. It's it's a little concerning that – I think it's a little concerning that he, ha- he has to say the same thing four years later. But at the end of the day, that goes back to nobody but him and the rest of the coaching staff that's been here during the last four years, you're the one who recruited these players. You're the one who's come up with the development plan for this program. At the end of the day, that's on nobody's sh- shoulders but yours. And it, and maybe this is a game where James Franklin sits down and says, we need a change of philosophy when it comes to recruiting, when it comes to this or that. But 
I mean, it's, this isn't the first time this has happened. There hasn't been any, you know, big noticeable change yet in philosophy when it comes to that type of recruitment and type of players. I'm not sure it's going to come now at this point, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, obviously, I'll go first, Marty. Uh, you know, Franklin has always, when it comes to D tackles and defensive ends, he's always had a specific type. You know, defensive tackles, you know, he'll he'll take, you know, a guy like Mustafer, who's a little bit bigger, but he likes his defensive tackles to be athletic, to be agile, to be able to, you know, burst past the offensive linemen and get into the backfield and cause havoc. He likes them to be athletic. Um, and defensive ends, he's always liked his guys to be tall, long and shifty that that's always been his you know length as well it's it's been a big thing for him along the edges you know i think the defensive ends are fine you know especially as chop and you know dennis sutton continue to develop but i'm not really concerned about that but dennis sutton had one of the better games out of everybody on saturday against michigan too yeah it's starting to come together for for dds which is great to see but yeah, I mean, the tackles, you know, I think there has to be a change in terms of the, the type of guys that they take more often. They they need to start, you know, actually taking some of those bigger guys and, you know, getting guys that are just space eaters. Because, yeah, I feel like Franklin, his problem is he builds a team to beat Ohio State and the type of team that they are. But along the way, he forgets about teams like Michigan and, you know, other teams that <laughs> they like to run the ball and you need bigger defensive tackles that can just eat up space and stop the run. You know, those games against Ohio State do not matter if you don't win those other games. So you need to be prepared and recruit for everybody, not just for your biggest game of the season. Agreed. Marty? <clears throat> yeah, you know, you, you go back to those comments after the game by James Franklin that personally really rubbed me the wrong way. Um, it was, to me, I took that as a lack of accountability by him um, essentially throwing his players, you know, the players he recruited, the players he and his coaching staff have developed and throwing them right under the bus for this performance. Um, yeah, I, I don't get it. You know, you don't you don't like the makeup of your defensive tackles. You want bigger players? Well, then go recruit a different style, uh, like you said, Anthony. But that's on you. That's on you as a coach. So nobody else. This isn't your one or two where you're playing with someone else's players. This isn't the NFL where you're stepping into a team where a former GM or a former head coach built it. You built this team. You built this roster. It's year nine. Um, just, yeah, the, the the gap that still exists between them and Michigan, um, especially when, you know, in recent years, it looked like that gap was pretty much non-existent. They were on a level footing with Michigan. is concerning. And if there's that much of a gap between them and Michigan, the gap between them and Ohio State is even larger and even more concerning. But yeah, it was it, they were just completely outclassed in so many ways on Saturday. And you know, after the game to come out and just not take any accountability for it at all in the, in the press conference as a head coach, it's it's not a good look. It, it it's not a good look. And you know, thinking about it with the defensive tackles, I I just looked at it and. You know what? I think Penn State's really missing, and I don't know if they've had one since Antonio Shelton left. Um, Penn State really doesn't have a one-tech defensive tackle, do they? I mean, who, who is there to eat up space in the middle of the defensive line? There, there's nobody. You look at the size. Um, and here's just the weights. I'm, I'm not going to list each player in the way, but here's just the weights of the defensive tackles on the roster. 276, 297, 264, 295, 296, 315, 295, 318, 292. I mean, PJ, I mean, PJ Musfer is your closest thing to maybe a one tech because of his size, but he's also one of your most athletic defensive tackles, and he's really good at rushing the passer. Um, I mean, there, there's just nobody there who can eat up space. And again, against a team like Michigan, you need somebody there who can eat up space, which then allows the guys around him to, you know, have less space to, you know, have to worry about to make plays in. When you go for the full athletic, smaller defensive tackles, you're asking guys to make plays almost every time and not miss. Um, and especially when you have a weak linebacker room like Penn State, I, I don't know. Do you am I, am I am I completely off on this, Marty? Sorry, I just don't mean to be. No, no, I don't think you are at all. It's it's 
that that's a big part of the issue too is with the way the linebacker room ha- has has shook out on this roster it makes the importance of defensive tackle that much higher so if you do have defensive tackles you're going to get pushed around against the physical offensive line like Michigan's um you when your linebackers aren't going to be there to clear, clean things up and fill the holes that's just going to create even bigger problems and i also think it was kind of Almost a recipe for disaster for Penn State. The linebacker room, obviously, we all knew was going to be an issue coming this season. It was an issue on Saturday. But what they couldn't ever afford with this linebacker room was a poor performance out of the defensive line slash defense tackles especially. And that's what they got. And when one – it's it's kind of like a levy or a dam. When, when one thing starts to crack, it's not going to take long for everything to break. And and that's what happened on Saturday against Michigan. There was one crack in the system, and it didn't take much for everything just to break loose. And and we saw we saw Penn State's offense not really have any success in the game. I mean, at one point they did put back to back drives together that were really good, uh, but that's a whole different discussion. But um, I guess to wrap up the defense, what what is your level of concern going forward? I mean. The next two games, obviously, are going to be tough with the back, with the running back matchups, but I still think the defense overall has a chance to finish the season rather strong, but it's obviously not going to be easy. And it, it may be ugly again, but what's just your overall confidence levels as we head into the last uh, six games of the season? I mean, it depends on the opponent. I mean... You know, the strength of the run game of your opponent is, I think, is really going to determine, you know, how this defense does on a game-by-game basis. You know, going into next week, yeah, there's a pretty high level of concern from what you just saw. You know, Minnesota is basically a Michigan light in terms of they run the ball a lot. They have a very talented running back in Mo Ibrahim. Very Ingram. good offensive line. Yeah, and they have a solid offensive line. So if you're Penn State, if you don't make any adjustments to what you just had happen to you this week, Minnesota is going to put it on you and then it's going to be answering a lot of questions and you're going to lose a lot of the fan base. So yeah, you, I am concerned about, you know, how this goes down on the defense for the next game or so. Marty. Yeah. I mean, even without Tanner Morgan right now, I have a hard time. I mean, the, the, the game's still fresh. The wounds are still fresh, but I have a hard time seeing them have a ton of defensive success against Minnesota because, you, you know, like you said, they're they're Michigan light. They're going to line up with a good offensive line. They look to run the ball down your throat with Mo Ibrahim, who's one of the best running backs in the Big Ten. Um, the, the, it, I have the book no is out on Penn State's believe. defense. Yeah, yeah, I have no reason to believe that um, they're they're going to slow Mo Ibrahim in, in this Minnesota rushing attack down, um, especially if if they try and attack it the same way they tried to attack Michigan with, you know, not loading the box, playing your safeties 15, 16, 17 yards off the ball. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I would be lying if I told you I have any confidence whatsoever in this rushing defense right now and their ability to slow down Minnesota's offense. Absolutely. Let's let's transition to the offensive side of the ball. Not a great day for Penn State, obviously. Very poor day overall. Um, less than 300 total yards. Sean Clifford did not have a good day. Uh, completed just seven of 19 passing attempts for 120 yards. That's a 37% completion percentage. Quarterback rating of 89.9. Um, he did leave the game at the end of the third quarter. Going into the fourth quarter, Drew Laura, Laura played the entire fourth quarter for Penn State. He completed five of 10 passes for 37 yards. Um, honestly, you look at the pass protection that Penn State gave to Sean Clifford, it was solid. They only allowed, I think, six or seven pressures on 29 pass attempts in the game overall. Clifford had a couple clean pockets. Um, but early on, you could tell that Clifford didn't have it. I think the first pass attempt of the game was a slant across the middle, and he misfired it. And it was uh, – it may have been even more – sorry, it may have even almost been intercepted. Um he, he had a couple good plays. I mean, that RPO he had was fantastic. Great read. A great read. Uh, his pass to Harrison Wallace uh, in the beginning of the third quarter was one of the best passes he's made all year. 
Um, but outside of that, just inconsistent uh, from the six-year quarterback, which you cannot have in this game. Um, Penn State's offense could not stay on the field, and the defense, of course, couldn't get off the field. It was a recipe for disaster, like I said. Um, Sean Clifford's banged up. If he's not 100%, do we all agree that Drew Allar is probably the best case – sorry, is probably the guy to start against Minnesota – if Sean Clifford's 100%, sure, you could throw him out there. But we, we've seen in the past, if Sean Clifford is not 100%, he does not give you the best chance of winning. We saw him what he did last year against Illinois when he was 100%. Um, now, this is, I think, a shoulder potential injury here. I'm not sure. Um, but, Anthony, yeah, uh, what, what's your thoughts? If, if Sean isn't healthy going into Minnesota, do you, do you give – 100% how they do give Drew the, the reins. I think there's a strong yeah, argument strong you argument. give Drew the reins regardless of if he's healthy or not. Um, I, I will preface this by saying that Drew Allard does not change the results of that game. You know, no. it's not like no, it does not. Drew is in there. Then maybe it's a, it's slightly closer at best, but, you know, Penn State's looking blown out completely whether Drew Allard or Sean Clifford was the quarterback in that game. It just didn't matter. Um, I think... What I will say is that Sean Clifford didn't help himself, and I think any sort of goodwill that he had had with the fan base is gone after that game. I think that was his last gasp to really cement himself, not just for this year, but also his legacy as a Penn State quarterback. I I think everybody's done with him. I think you're going to find it very hard-pressed to find any supporters of Clifford still left out there. Um... I think it's time to go to Drew Aller. I'm going to say it now. I'm officially ready. Um, I know Marty was ready a long, long time ago, and I understand why. But I think it's it's time to see what Drew can do. I think there are some things that, you know, he does that Clifford can't do, and there's going to be growing pain. Some of those throws he made against Michigan were ugly, but he also made some nice throws. And I think everyone would be a lot more willing to grow with Drew uh, than they would to watch Clifford just be inconsistent. Um, I'm sure it'll be Clifford starting against Minnesota as long as he can go. But if he's not healthy, you definitely don't start him. And there's a strong argument that you shouldn't start him anyway at this point. Before I let Marty go, I'm not going to get into a debate of who should start. Um, I think if Sean Clifford's healthy, Sean Clifford's going to start. Um, that being said, I do think at some point, whether it's this week, Maybe after Ohio State, because right now I'm chalking up Ohio State's loss, as anybody I think is likely doing, as they should be doing after this past week especially. It was a loss going into the Michigan game. It's a definitely a loss right now. Um, I, but the way I see it overall is I don't think the floor with Drew Allard, Aller, sir, Drew Aller gets any – I don't think the floor is any lower. I think the floor for Penn State is still – Probably nine and three this season. That's at what they absolutely should be. Anything beyond that would be a uh, a disaster at this point. I would say um, you could argue perhaps the ceiling is. I, I think you could argue the ceiling could be higher because of the potential. I think you could argue the ceiling may be slightly lower. Now I think I think both quarterbacks could get you to ten and two. I think just in terms of the offense's abilities and what the offense could possibly do. I think you can argue either one has a higher ceiling. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't think the, the, the floor is any lower. But at the same point, I think at some point here this season, maybe after you lose a second time, you have to consider going to Drew the rest of the way just to see what you have in him going into 2023 and also to see what Mike Yursich can do with uh, – a quarterback like him going forward because honestly the offensive play calling against Michigan on Saturday was just um, some of the worst we've seen out of Mike Yersich yet in his tenure in Happy Valley. Um, it, left, it left a lot to be desired and it, there's a lot of questions surrounding that offense going forward, whether uh, regarding both Yersich and the quarterback play going forward. Um, but that's where I sit. I, I just think, the floor for Penn State doesn't get much lower, and at some point or the other this season, you need to find out what you have in Drew against legitimate Big Ten talent. 
He, yes, he played a couple, he played one series against Purdue, but what we saw against Auburn, Ohio, and even, uh, did, did he, yeah, in Central Michigan, do, doesn't really give a good sense of what he really is. You need to see him against actual Big Ten competition against once to know what you have going into next season, in my opinion. Marty, what's your thoughts? I mean, you know, like Anthony said, in my opinion, that the Drew Lahr should should have already be the starting quarterback on this team. Um, but Anthony or Dylan, you make a really good point about Mike Yursich. His play calling, um, creativeness, the scheming, a lot of it has left a lot to be desired in recent weeks. And to me, a big reason why you want to give Alar the bulk of the playing time down the stretch is to see if that it does your such open things up more. Does that change things on his front? Um, because uh, absolutely, because because you're calling a whole different game for a quarterback like yeah, Drew yeah. compared to Sean. Yeah, I mean, not even just their talent and their ability, but with Drew, it's going to be more of that pro style type of stuff. So, you know, I don't know. Which Sean has just, been Yursich's bread and butter to a degree during his exactly. career. Exactly. But, you know, it, it's a moot point. Like you said, Clifford's going to start. He can show up at Beaver Stadium in a wheelchair on Saturday and James Franco throw a helmet on him and tell him to get out there. He's going to start. Um, he shouldn't. And it, it, it's not even – it's – and to me, it's not even a, oh, let's play for the future, et cetera, et cetera. Sean Clifford clearly is not 100%. When he's not 100%, he can't run around and use his legs. And for Sean Clifford to be effective, what Sean Clifford does best is improvising, running around, using his legs. So if he can't do that, he's not at his best. He's not going to be effective as a quarterback. That alone should get him on the bench this week. But I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm assuming Clifford still starts. Um, I mean, James Franklin even said after the game, the only reason Alar came in against Michigan was because of Clifford being banged up. It had nothing to do with Clifford's performance. But if going 10 for 20 with an interception against Northwestern doesn't get you benched, I assume nothing will. Um, I, I do think just in general, not just quarterback, but at some point, um, again, maybe it's after you lose you, – on paper, you lose to a high state. I mean, or whenever you suffer a second loss. Um but at some point, I think you need you, you have a lot of good young talent on this team. A lot of talent that could help lead you to the places you want to be in a year or two. And not just at quarterback, but you need to find out what you have. And I think getting those guys on the field more and more and allowing them to get serious playing time is going to be big. I mean, James Franklin talked about it at the beginning of the year of getting this these, these guys on the field to create better depth. Well, I mean... I, I'm not sure getting – putting a bunch of these young guys out there significantly lowers the floor of the team overall uh, compared to where some of, the, some of them are with the stars. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'm not – you you're not going to put any freshmen out in the secondary. The secondary is one of the best in the Big Ten. Sorry, one of the best in the country. You're not going to do that. But a linebacker, a quarterback, would they've done that running back. And running back's a position I actually think right now that you can argue that with how the offensive line has played the last few weeks – um, and with the style of defense Michigan played, Kevon Lee may have been almost a better running back in that game just because he's a little bit bigger than Allen and Singleton. And Allen and Singleton, while they're both talented, very much have bright futures, neither are polished running backs at this point and have struggled the last few weeks as teams have adapted to Penn State's offense. Uh, I'm not saying – you need to make Kevon Lee the starter again or give him a, a huge amount of tackles. But I think getting him a little bit more involved, it may not be the worst thing either. I don't know if you guys agree on that or not. Um, I don't know. Real quick, I'll, start, I'll still circle back one more thing on the quarterbacks. You said about the floor. I agree. It doesn't lower the floor at all, making the move. If anything, I think it raises the floor a little bit and definitely raises the potential ceiling. Um, as for the running backs, I think Saturday should have been really should have been a Katron Allen game. Katron Allen's style, sure, style sure. Is, is what was going to work against Michigan. He still brings him that burst, some of that explosiveness that Singleton does. Um, I really would have liked to have seen more of Katron Allen, especially early in the game. 
But, yeah, I don't know. Again, it was just the game plans on so many fronts were mind-boggling, and the running back rotation was part of that. Yeah, and, again, I, I'm not saying you need to give a huge amount of carries to Keevon Lee, but he had one tag of, sorry, one carry for six yards against Michigan. I think he had one carry against Northwest. He, he's really only had, I think, a handful of carries since Auburn. Um, but just, uh, the the running back rotation has always been a strange uh, philosophy and how they use it when they choose to use it. Um, but Anthony, what's your thoughts on just the young guys, the running backs, anything we've talked about here? And then a few more thoughts, and then I guess we can wrap this up. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing with a lot of the young guys, specifically guys like Drew, like their hope is that they can get through the Ohio State game first. I mean, because, you know, the Ohio State game is really a trial by fire for any young player. I mean, we'll, we'll see if, if their hand gets forced in any of those situations. But, I mean, yeah, I, I don't see any reason why you wouldn't start playing a lot of those young guys. Um you know, like a lot of them do raise your, your ceiling moving forward, maybe not for this year, but for the years to come. And if you come out of that Ohio State game and that's your second or even your third loss, God forbid, you know, I think at that point, yeah, the next four games, you know, are, are winnable regardless. That That's when you should really start turning things over for the future and really starting to see what you have for the next season. So, you know, we'll see how they choose to play it. You know, we've talked about the quarterbacks enough. Um, as as for Kevon Lee and the running backs, I, I kind of agree with you. I mean, Kevon Lee clearly is not as talented as Singleton or Allen, but there's still a role for him somewhere in this offense. They just need to carve it out a little bit more. Um, Singleton has been... And plus, with. you're you're one injury away from him. Like, if one of these young freshmen go down, are you just going to give one of them all the... Car- like, to a degree, you almost have, you have to keep him fresh as well. Because after him, there's no... I, Tank Smith is, you know, a great story. But if you're giving Tank Smith carries and Big Ten games that aren't blowouts, I mean, that's kind of kind of concerning. Yeah, I, I will just want to say about Singleton, you know, he's definitely struggled the last couple of games. I don't know if the uh, the fumbles from the Northwestern game got in his head a little bit, but you know, he's definitely been a little off recently. I don't think the game plan really helped him much. He's clearly not a between-the-tackles runner, at least not at this point in his career. Yeah, career. I mean, his, his strength is always going to be getting to the outside and using his explosiveness and his speed to get out there. But, you know, he's clearly not a guy that can run between the tackles. And that's kind of what they've been doing, which I just I don't get why they're doing that. But that's a conversation for another day. So, yeah, I agree with Marty that this should have been a, a big Katron Allen game. You know, mix in a little Kevon Lee and, and, and see if you can get Singleton to the outside. But I think Michigan did a good job of limiting a lot of that as well. Absolutely. Um, off- let's talk about a couple more things to the offense and wrap this up. Um Starters, um, not starters, but for starters, um, the lack of Brennan Strain just that's a failure on Mike Gersage and John Clifford. Uh, Michigan's linebackers coming to this game struggled in coverage. Uh, I, I read the stat in the preview, uh, their top three linebackers in coverage 33 for 36, uh, opposing quarterbacks were coming into this game. Uh, Brandon Strange was targeted once, he's been your best playmaker all year, and he has not been a part of the offense the last two weeks. That it, it makes no sense. It makes no sense to me. Uh, that is, um, it, it ju- that just cannot happen. It cannot happen. Um, so Brent Strange needs to be a bigger part of this game plan going forward. Their game plans going forward, I think. Um, the offensive line uh, obviously took a step back in their run protection. I think they've done a good job most of the year. Is this just a blip? Then I think. It, if it's just a blip, that's one thing, but if this is a, con- a trend that continues going forward, uh, that raises questions once again about the offensive line and Phil Trout one. Um, the wide receivers, I think we mentioned it at the top, Marty. I thought the wide receivers played well. Harrison Wallace made a nice re- catch on that Sean Clifford throw. The only play that I look at back in the game that I think that could have been a missed a misplay by wide receivers, Parker Washington on that fourth down, uh, 
that was a throw by Clifford that was catchable. That being said, Clifford had an easier throw to Mitchell Tinsley. Either way you look at it, a missed play by the Penn State offense. One play later, uh, Blake Quorum opens up the game going 61 yards uh, to make it a 31-17 game. And from that point on, the game was over. Um, and then I, I think that's all the other really thoughts I have. Uh, the offensive line's run blocking and then Sean Clifford's poor play did not give Penn State's offense any chance here to have any sustained success. And um, that's obviously definitely a major concern because Sean Clifford's play the last three weeks has definitely taken – uh, quite a few steps back from what we saw in the first three weeks of the season. Um, I guess I'll just let you both quickly uh, touch on any of those subjects and any other offensive sub, uh, other subjects about the offense in general, and then we'll wrap this up. Because I think uh, beyond that, special teams wise, Penn State did fine. Uh, Barney Moore is fine. Jay Pinnerger did what he had to do. Uh, really, the the two big things that stand out on special teams was Nick Singleton's fumble or somewhat of a fumble basically on that kickoff. And then uh, Gabriel Nowusu uh, kicking the ball out of bounds on one kickoff. But other than that, nothing really to talk about special teams. Marty, uh, your thoughts on offense, then Anthony, and then we'll give our final thoughts on the game. Um. Well, real quick, I think it's funny that, that Nick Singleton fumble on the kickoff if Michigan's kicker doesn't get him, he probably scores on that. So that that's just kind of goes to show the athletic freak in his burst that he has, that he turned that botched into nearly a touchdown return. Um, offensively, though, I agree the receivers played one of their better games of the year. That catch by Trey Wallace was a tremendous play. Hopefully that will get him going now. Um, and, uh, like, I just the, – the quarter – with Sean Clifford – it's almost as if these last three games or the or last well, all six games, but these last three in particular, it's almost like a his career wrapped up in the six games where he plays well. And then he just slowly, but surely just regresses and plateaus out and doesn't ever get any better. Any better. And that's, yeah. That's been his career. Like I, I don't know. I just, and this is, I mean, this is the, discussion for another day we probably have an entire podcast episode about it but th there's nothing he does better now compared to how he did it in his first year as a starter and for a four-year starter six-year quarterback that's just unacceptable and it's going to hamper your offense it's going to hamstring your offense and that's what we've seen anthony what's your final thoughts on the offense and i mean we could talk about the offensive more in this game but like we said at the end of the day the offense could have scored 30 points it would not have mattered yeah, those things go hand in hand too, because obviously the offense didn't help out the defense, but the defense sure as hell didn't help themselves. So it wouldn't have made a difference, like you said. They could have put up thirty points and they still would have lost. But you know, obviously, I didn't understand the lack of tight end usage. Um, Bretton Strange has been your best weapon to date. Why? I don't know if Michigan just did a really good job of keeping him under wraps and really focusing in on him. Or if for some reason Penn State just went away from him today, I, I, I don't know. I wasn't really paying that much attention, but that needs to be fixed. Um, the receivers I thought played fine. I didn't. I didn't see any big drops per se. I, I didn't like nothing that stood out to me. Like, oh my god, how did they mess that up? So that's good. You know, I guess the receivers were okay when given the opportunity, but yeah, I mean, it was just a cornucopia of suck. It really just all around. Everybody sucked and. Just a lot needs to be fixed. I think that's going to be the uh, the title of this episode, a cornucopia of suck. Because um, other than that, um, I, I from here, Penn State, you know, it, Minnesota is a game that's very winnable, and especially in the whiteout, but it's not going to be easy. I think the major thing, that, the major storyline going to this one, not beyond just everything that happened against Michigan is – Penn State in four of their last five seasons have suffered their second loss in the week after their first loss or the next game after their first loss. Um, that is a concerning trend for this team. They have often had one loss uh, turn into two losses, and then their seasons kind of spiral out of control at times. Uh, not all the time, but sometimes. I mean, 2020, uh, the loss to Indiana really just 
you know, it took all the wind out of their sails before the season started. Um, 20 last year, they lose to Iowa, and then Clifford's not healthy. Uh, and even though they're coming off a bye week and they lose to Illinois, and then they go from 5-0 and to 7-5, and I don't think they're going to go from 5-0 and to 7-5 and this year. But if, I mean, it's not like you can say it hasn't happened before. And I think that that's the concern thing for Penn State fans is you can very, and I wouldn't say easily, but you can imagine a world where it happens again. Um, but, I mean, we'll, we'll get our answer on Saturday. I think if Penn State comes out and plays the style of football and the football that we've seen in the past, then they'll be fine going forward. They may lose to Ohio State still, but they'll be fine going forward. But, I mean, if they come out and lose to Minnesota – all bets are off for the remainder of the season. This is year nine for James Franklin in the first eight. Penn State's lost back-to-back games at least once during a season and six of the eight. So history tells you that odds are, rather it's this weekend or... India. Odds are they will lose back. It's just that's what ha- it's what James Franklin does. Yep. That, that, I mean, that's... Stats don't lie. Stats don't lie. And the- yeah, I'm going to be very interested interested to see how this team comes out this weekend because I talked about this with you, Dylan, right before we went on air. I don't know if Marty was in the group chat in the in the room yet when we did this, but this is the first time that when Penn State's lost their first game of the season because we talked about that stat. This is the first time that they've really gotten their teeth kicked in in that loss. Penn State doesn't get blown out. Get completely yeah, because uh, Michigan 2016 was the second loss because they lost to Pittsburgh in week two. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, this was the first time that they got completely blown out in that type of fashion as their first loss. Um, maybe that's what makes them look in the mirror. You know, we, we all played sports growing up. We all know that when you get your teeth kicked in and dominated like they did, you get your ass kicked. You tend to look at it differently than when you lose a heartbreaker. So. Maybe maybe that's what this team needed to happen. It seems like after Auburn, they were just been feeling themselves a little bit too much, and this is the end result of that. Maybe an ass-kicking is what a team like, Jesus, a team like them needs to really get themselves back on the right direction. We'll find out this weekend. That's devil's advocate for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I said at the top, uh, it, it – this type of loss kind of has to be a wake-up call. And if it's not, then I think that's even more concerning. This is the type of loss that should change some philosophies, I think. And it doesn't have to be major philosophy, just how you go about doing stuff. Because at the end of the day, and Marty kind of talked about it uh, a little earlier, at the end of the day, two years ago, Penn State and Michigan were in a very similar spot, correct, with the 2020 seasons. Both had horrible 2020 seasons. Since that season Michigan has become an elite team in college football and Penn State has become a they're still a solid team I mean Penn State should go 10 and 2 on paper this year 9 and 3 at worst that's a solid team a top 25 team but while Michigan has become elite Penn State has become I I I a a quality and good team, but not a great team. They've taken a step back from where they were 2016 to 2019. Uh, and Michigan had some struggles there before the 2020 season as well. But uh, credit to Jim Harbaugh and that Wolverine program. They have found a way to refine their foot in at that 2020 season. And they have gone on and become, like I said, an elite football team over the last two years. And Penn State is much closer, I think, to the Michigan States and the Maryland's of the Big Ten right now than they are to the Ohio State and Michigan's of the Big Ten. And it's not going to get any easier in the next few years. USC is coming. And there's going to be other teams that are coming to this conference that uh, are probably going to be there. There's probably at least one other team that's going to come to the conference that's closer to a, a Michigan and Ohio State, in my opinion, than a Michigan State and Maryland. Uh, I mean, or I would say Oregon, if Oregon would come, Oregon's closer to 
the top than they are to, you know, Michigan State and uh, Maryland. Would you agree with that, Marty? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Same with Notre Dame. Dame. That third score, score, I think, eventually winds up in the Big Ten. Yeah. Even, even this season aside, side, I'd, I'd still put them in that boat. So, so ultimately, it, it's not going to get any easier. So this is something that, like, it, it can't be something that takes – a, a few years to change. It has to be something that changes over the next one or two years, or Penn State could be in a very bad spot once the Big Ten expands because it's not getting easier. But ultimately, uh, we could worry about the next few years down the road for Penn State. Penn State has to worry about Minnesota first because, like we said, they have tend to lose games after their first loss of the season. Uh, was this a wake-up call on Saturday for Penn State, or is it the beginning of another, t- you know, uh, a, a, another s- spiral uh, towards the bottom. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, but at the end of the day, Penn State on Saturday got their butts whooped for four quarters by Michigan by final score 41 uh, 17. We'll talk to you guys later this week to preview the Minnesota game. Uh, gentlemen, any last thoughts on this game? Uh, all right. Well, uh, Thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of the podcast. Uh, I'm sure you didn't want to listen about this game any more than you had to. Um, So after you're done listening to it, be like Penn State. And uh, this one probably should be buried uh, next to that temple tape somewhere. Uh, But until next time, everybody, have a good one, and we'll talk to you guys later this week.